Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about the training regime and the unit composition of the SIG. So, we talked about the SIG in the last in the first video and this series is all about them. So, what's the deal with the SIG? So, they're formed by Captain Buck and he goes to the commandos um, and specifically asks for German commandos for for Czech, Czechoslovakian commandos for any commandos who speak German and he wants to speak to them and he lays out his plan to these commandos in um, he does he, you know how these things work they say I'm starting up a new unit it's sort of like the commandos but different you know like David Sterling did with the SAS or the LRDG would you like to be a part of my new unit and some guys say well I'm pretty happy with the commandos and they walk out then some guys stay and you say well it's actually incredibly dangerous, and if you are captured, you will absolutely be tortured and killed. And does anyone want to leave? And then, then those people walk out. And then you say, right, what we're going to do is dress up in German uniforms. If you're comfortable with that, stay. If you're not, leave. And you basically whittle it down. And at the end, they ended up with a bunch of guys. Uh, they ended up creating a unit of 38, including the two officers. Uh, the other officer, was we'll speak about him later. He was actually brought in because of something that happened later. So... Uh, actually, no, he was actually he was not brought in because of something that happened later. He was given more power because of something that happened later. We're not going to talk, but that'll be in the next video. Um, right now, they've got these 38 men, and they take them back to a camp on the Suez, which is basically, if you find out about it, you get taken to a little room where an SOE agent will uh, do stuff to you and uh, make sure you don't tell anyone about it. It's a very, very secret area. And in this camp, German uniforms... German training, German doctrine, German everything. And I literally mean German everything. German underwear, German socks, German food cooked the German way on German field kitchens. Your orders are given to you on German paper, German administrative staff officer paper, written with German pens, German pencils, German typewriters. The chocolate you eat is German. The rations you get are German. The language you speak is German. The language you think in is German. Uh, they'd actually come around and kick you in the middle of the night and wake you up and start yelling at you. And if you said a single word of English, you'd be punished because you had to dream in German. You had to be German. You had to be German. And for a lot of guys, this wasn't a huge issue because they were Germans. Uh, it wasn't all Jewish. Uh, lots of free French as well. Um, remember, of course, the French Foreign Legion had Germans in it. And there were two parts of the French Foreign Legion. This is important later, so I'll talk about it now. Um, there were two parts of the French Foreign Legion. The part that sided with the French, the Vichy French, uh, led by Philippe Patin, um, famous hero of World War I, um, a rather infamous traitor of World War II, Philippe Patin's um, Vichy French, and then the Free French, which were nominally led by Charles de Gaulle, although uh, the, the actual extent that de Gaulle controlled these guys is a bit iffy. But anyway, the, the Free French and the Vichy French. And so there were free French who were in the French Foreign Legion at the start of the war. There were Germans in the, F the French Foreign Legion who had decided that they were, they were going to stick with it. And they actually escaped to Dunkirk or they fled down to Algeria or they were just stationed in the Middle East. Whatever happened, they basically found themselves in a position to keep fighting for the French Foreign Legion. And the, whereas the Vichy French uh, were incorporated back into the, the French army slash German army. And a lot of the Germans in this unit were actually basically taken out and then put into the just normal German army because the Germans wanted those guys back with them. That's important later, anyway. So, Free French, Czechoslovakians, Slovaks, uh, Serbs, uh, every, you name it, it was there. Russians who were German. Basically, if you spoke German fluently and naturally, you were in this unit. Um, there was actually one guy, Tiffin, who was in the BEF. He was in the BEF and he volunteered for the commandos as soon as it started out. He was actually a Jew from Germany um, whose father, whose mother and father were meant to be deported um, to, to Poland. And he put up his hand and said, I will replace my mother for this deportation. And the Germans agreed with that. I'm not sure why they didn't just send him as well. I'm not sure why they just deported the two parents and not him. He was a like 19-year-old. Maybe they figured... But they wouldn't let him in the army anyway because he was Jewish. <laughs> there were Jews in the German army, but... Anyway, that's it. That's it. another whole subject altogether. So he and his father are deported to Poland. Um, we all know what's going to happen there. Uh, this is pre-war, but yeah. So he escapes on... Um, he escapes. He doesn't know where his father is or what's going on at this point. 
He bribes his way under a ship headed for for Palestine. Illegally. It's a ship that's like a, a container ship or some sort of cruiser type ship. It's not really explained. It doesn't really matter. And basically there were 700 Jews uh, who bribed their way under this ship to get out of Germany. Uh, this is just before the Second World War starts. It, his father, it said his father was deported to Poland. That may just mean deported to an area that would then take them to Poland, maybe, because, of course, they couldn't be deported to a country that hadn't been conquered yet. But uh, anyway, that, that was what's written in the books. And, it's, uh, and yeah, anyway, so he and the passengers um, freak out when the boat lands at Cyprus and the, the captain is there to just take on more food, more supplies, more water. He's running heat really, really low, because 700 people. Uh, they commandeer the ship, take it over, and then drive it to Palestine, which is, of course, a British territory at this point. It will become Israel in forty-eight. They land ashore and are then immediately detained because you can't just land in a country and then walk off a boat and then just like buy a house or something. Like You, you can't just do that. They have to vet you. They have to make sure, especially these are Germans. And uh, let's just say the Germans are pretty uh, ramping up in 1938, 1939. The British were not just going to let Germans, no matter how Jewish they claim to be, rock up in one of their territories and just disappear. So the British held these guys under supervision until the war broke out, in which case the British just went, go. What, we don't have time to deal with this. We don't have the resources to deal with this. Our BEF has just had the absolute tar kicked out. Well, uh, until war is declared, and then the British just let them go. They just do whatever you want. Uh, sign this thing that says you're not a spy, and that if you are a spy, we'll basically kill you and then arrest your whole family and throw them back to Germany anyway sign this thing that says you're not a spy and you can go. And uh, our man Tiffin, his name is like Tiffin, Tiffin Brauner or something like that, but he changes to, to Tiffin for as long as he's with the SIG. Uh, he actually joins the BEF and he fights in France and he's one of the last men to actually leave. It's quite brave for a Jewish person who is German to fight in the BEF. That's insane. And then as soon as the commandos open up, he joins the commandos and then he's, he's commando Middle East does some stuff with them, and then he joins the SIG at the first chance he gets. There's some other guys there too, but that's just sort of, that was uh, not a story that's typical, but not a story that was completely out of the blue either. I picked sort of one of the more middle, moderate stories, someone who'd, you know, fled and then gone somewhere for safety and then and had to be sort of joined the army, and now he's worked his way into the commandos, and now he's here. Uh, there were other recruits, people who were just recruited. Um, they were put through commando training. You had to be at least commando trained or SAS trained. Which was a big reason why when this unit broke up, these guys just went back to the commandos and the SAS. So you had to be good. You couldn't just speak the language. This is not like the resistance forces giving interpreters in 1944-45. In this is actual special forces guys who are just very skilled. Anyway, also what they'd done is they had gone to Cairo HQ and gone to the sort of typing pool, the the women's auxiliary unit, the, the, the force of women who were basically doing admin work for the army. There were... They were managing all the paperwork and filing and they were taking phone calls and, you know, all the sort of things that were going on back then. And they picked out women who looked specifically German um, and they posed them up in German clothes and took photographs of them. The sort of photographs that uh, young men off at war keep with them. And I don't want to know why they have them, but they have them and what they do with them. But they have these photographs of these women in these poses and then they dressed up in their DAC uniforms and they stood next to these women and then they dressed up in normal German army uniforms and stood next to these women and, and photographed and they put all these photographs in SOE provided passports with photographs taken on German cameras and everything German I cannot stress how German this unit was <laughs> it's, everything was German everything down to their friggin underwear guys uh, everything was German they, and then these, these women were writing uh, love notes and just general family updates, and then they had you know, notes from their mother, notes from a father, notes from their uh, love heart, their sweethearts, all written by different women. And of course, if one woman, one woman just wrote all the letters and you put them all together, it looks suspicious. So they had to get different women to write all the letters, and they left them out in the sun, they crumpled them up, they, they, put, they made them a little bit wet to sort of simulate some tears that had fallen on them by, you know, that mother or girlfriend who had heard that their son or, or partner had been wounded. They had to make up families for themselves. And on the spot, they had to be able to say their, their parents, their occupations, when their parents were born, their birthdays, how many children they had, what genders their children were, how old their children were, when were their children's birthdays, where did they go to school, where did they live, what were their children's jobs if they were old enough to have them. They had to literally just bang, 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 and if they got anything wrong, punishment. These guys were good. And their cover stories were basically 
impervious. Um, one of the things you have to be careful of when you make cover stories is you should keep them as close to the truth as possible, especially for military actions like this. And that's what they did. So if you had a family in Germany, they would simply just change the name. Uh, one of the guys, actually, his cover story was that he was dating like the Nazi, um, head Nazi in his area's daughter. Like that was his cover story, which was, um, since he knew the family of this like top Nazi, it was it was easy for him to yeah. You know, if someone ever said to him, you know, oh, I know that family. He's like, yeah, they they live at this street and they live on this you know, in this house and it's this color. And he drives this kind of car. And before and before he was this you know little psychopathic you know mini dictator, he used to be the florist or something like they they could actually know this stuff. So it was it was very handy for these guys who were actually German to just make a cover story very similar to their own stories. Anyway, they had all that, but they didn't know how the DAC talked. They didn't they know how Germans talk, but they didn't know how DAC talked. They didn't know the DAK, the, the, the German uh, Africa Corps, the Deutsch, the Deutsch Africa Corps, not the Dutch Africa Corps, the Deutsch Africa Corps. They didn't know how they talked. Uh, they didn't know how they swore. They didn't know how they the sung, what sort of songs they sung. How did they eat their food? Was there any food that they particularly liked and any food they particularly hated? Um, what was the fashion style? I mean, of course, the German army you had to dress in a German uniform, but was it fashionable to roll the sleeves up? on hot sunny days or was you just always kept them down how did you lace your boots did certain units have certain ways of doing it with the did the recon guys lace their boots differently because they just had to be different did they use different types of laces you know it's uh, oh, they didn't i'm just being facetious there but you know they could have how were the vehicles did they call a jeep a jeep or well, not a jeep did they call a kubelwagen a kubelwagen or was there a local name for it did they call a, a Sherman tank a Sherman tank? Well, they called them Tommy Cookers at some point, but yeah, that's obviously it's a bit later. But you know, you understand what I'm saying. That there are there is slang that armies pick up in the field that you don't you can't know from picking up a few drill manuals. The British had drill manuals. They had German drill manuals. They had German all this stuff, so they could teach them the German drill, but they couldn't teach them the German soldier. They, so what they needed was German soldiers, and there were two ways that they got German soldiers. Number one was by simply walking into the POW camps, one or two at a time, and just pretending to be German soldiers, German POWs. British had a whole bunch of German soldiers just laying around, so learn from them. And that was one way they did it. Then the men would just cycle through these POW camps, and, and you know, they would just learn to be Germans. And they picked up on a whole bunch of stuff, but they, what they really, really needed was someone who could tell them everything. Like, you might, you might be able to pick up stuff from seeing things, but you don't know everything until you know someone who does. Like, you have to find someone who is living that life who can then say to you, okay, you've seen, the way you've seen them eat, you don't, you're not doing it right because the reason they do it is because of this. You don't know the reason why they're doing something. Maybe they drink their coffee with two hands like that and you start doing it because you're trying to keep your hands warm, but the real reason is you don't want sand to get in there. Now, this is not real, but this is just, you know, something. So maybe that your hands should be more protecting sand rather than keeping warm just the basic reasons behind why things are done you know why is it called a you know, why is a kubel wagon not called a kubel wagon why is it called this other thing well it's like oh well you should know the reason behind that so if anyone you know if there's a chance for you to make a joke you can make the joke you know jokes are a great way to fit in around um, new people especially if you're trying to infiltrate a unit uh, if if it, say that they called it the hippity hop or some nonsense they didn't but you know say the, the kubel wagon was called a hippity hop and you hit a bumpy bit of road and you went bounce, bounce, bounce. You could turn to the, the German next to you and just be like, oh, that's why they call it the hippity hop, I guess. And then laugh and build, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that wasn't what happened, but y you guys understand what I'm trying to say. I keep saying the same thing over and over again. You understand. They needed that glue. They had all the components and it looked nice. It was a nice house of cards that they built for themselves. But they needed some super glue just to run along all those seams with super glue. So that if someone came along and shook it, it wouldn't just all crumble down. And they found two guys who's... We only have their, their code names, which is Brockner and Esner. And that was what they were known by to the SIG, Brockner and Esner. Um, Brockner was an Unteroffizier, a, 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 a senior NCO, a staff sergeant. And uh, Esner was a, a Feldwebel in the, in the DAK. Both were in the DAC. Both were actually previously in the, uh, the French Foreign Legion. Remember I said before that they were the Vichy and the normal, the Free French? Vichy, free, Vichy, free. Anyway, those... Uh, these guys had basically been in the in the French Foreign Legion and then joined the German Army. Well, they didn't really. They got taken out of the French Foreign Legion and then put in the German Army by conscription, given NCO ranks. And the Camp 020, which was the British um, double agent camp, it was the, the, the camp that took every single spy that came into Britain, because Ultra, the program Ultra, 
they knew who were the spies. They had just, someone would send a message to a, um, so what would happen is, the Germans would have like a spy master in Britain, which the SOE knew about and had tapped all his communications slash arrested and turned him. I'm not 100% sure about that, but they, they knew, they got every letter that was sent to him. And so when the British, got, when the Germans were like, okay, we're sending over spy number 37, here's his name, here's what he looks like, here's his cover story, here's where he's going to be landing, here's how he's going to be getting to the country, here's when and where he's going to meet you, and here's the things you need to tell him, the British would just go, oh, thank you, uh, and then send SOE agents or, or MI5 or 6 agents to just arrest the guy and then bring him to Camp 020 or 020, where he would be turned against the Germans or basically just incarcerated. Um, they didn't torture you at Camp 020. Not physically, anyway. They thought physical torture was cowardly, which it is, and that it's useless, which it is. If you just beat the pulp out of someone, um, or if you beat someone into a pulp, or you just electrocute them until they're just fried, they're not going to tell you as much as... Yeah. They had other techniques. They would, you know, sound deprivation, and then massive noise, light deprivation, and then blinding light. They, they could get you. Yeah, I got, that's probably considered torture now, like locking you in a cell for two weeks, and just, yeah, you'll crack. They didn't physically torture, but they maybe did a little mental. The, uh, there was actually an explicit rule at this camp was no physical torture whatsoever for these spies. And a lot of these spies became double agents. Um, they compromised a lot of them. Uh, yeah. Oh, you have a family? We'll get a prostitute in. Take photos of you with the prostitute. Even if you're, you know, there you go. It will ruin your life, your marriage will destroy everything. You'll never be able to go home because everyone in your village or your town is going to know what you did. Not only that you're a spy, but we've also falsified a whole bunch of records here that say you're a double agent already. Uh, we've already sent back like three um, false caches of information with lies in them that the German government, you know, if we l leak another thing to them, they're going to know it's lies, so you'll be dead anyway. Might as well work for us, and they, they turn people like that. Uh, if you couldn't be turned, they just locked you in prison. Or just killed you. There were quite a few people who were just executed. Anyway, maybe not at the camp, but, but there were German spies who were just executed because it is illegal to spy. I don't know if everyone knows this. It is, it, it's utterly illegal to spy. You, you will be killed for doing it. Uh, it's also illegal to dress up in the enemy uniform like the SIG are doing. It's death. Uh, and Hitler actually makes that abundantly clear, uh, as we'll find out later on. Anyway, so the SOE, the military intelligence, the, the, the MPs all just scour these DAC camps until they find two people, Brockner and Esther, who they vet to be trainers for the SIG. I cannot stress how important that sentence is. They vet them to be trainers for the SIG vetted 100% by these these institutions. Remember that sentence. These people are verified, vetted, 100% approved to be trainers for the SIG. Keep them in the back of your hats, because someone doesn't. <laughs> someone very important doesn't keep that information in the back of their hats. The back of their hats, what else? Someone doesn't keep that information in mind, and stuff happens because of it. But keep it, keep it in the back of your mind. There, keep it in your under your hat. Just, just keep that sentence. These men are hundred percent verified by the top people who are never wrong to be trainers for the SIG. So, and that's what they do. They train the SIG to the point where they're able to actually send the whole unit to do uh, road watch, but not the road watch. The commandos, the LIDG, the SAS, the uh, everyone else does. They dress up as. Gendarmerie with the, with the sort of, they call it dog chains, I think. It's the, the gorget with the chain on it. Which is, it used to be the symbol for an officer, but the Germans use it for, for gendarmerie. Gendarmerie are military police. And the French use the same word. It's a French word, shockingly. Gendarmerie is a French word. But um, they, they, they dress up as gendarmerie and just set up a checkpoint on a, on a coast road. And they just stop every car that comes past. Your name, you know, give me the names of all the officers in your unit. Where are you going? Oh, cool. Where are you coming from? Oh, yeah. How'd you get there? Okay. What road are you going to take to get there? Okay. And when do you have to be there? By. Now, any gossip? And they just do this every single time. Oh, you got a truck, convoy of five trucks there. Where are you headed? Oh, yeah, cool. We Yeah, there's a few people going there today. Is there going to be some attack soon, you know? Oh, you heard rumors. Oh, cool. And they were the most effective Roadwatch people in the world. Uh, Roadwatch, remember, of course, is the way to verify Ultra. It's also a way to just keep an eye on the Germans. But uh, they did this a few times, and then they just infiltrated a German camp. They just went in and melted into the camp. They, these guys, there's like a couple of different ways you can get inside. There's sort of, you can, like if you've got a bunch of guys who, you see this a lot in a movie, like a bunch of guys who can't speak German, but they, they sort of, as long as you keep their mouth shut, they'll be fine. They dress like a German, and they sort of walk the right way. 
that's sort of like infiltrating a camp. Then they're, that's sort of like sneaking into a camp, sorry. Then you've got the guys who can, like the SIG were prior to their training. They could blend into a German camp, but you could find them if you if you knew what to look for. Like you could find the guy who's, who's eating the soup the wrong way or, or he's, he's not eating the bread, even though like that's the most popular food or whatever. Or, yeah, he hasn't opened the tin peaches. I'm like, that's, no one ever not opens the tin peaches, you know, that sort of thing. But these guys could literally just disappear into a camp. They could absolutely melt into a German camp to the point where some of them take their pay books to the German quartermaster and get money from the German quartermaster. Their pay books are that good. They actually get sort of like, they look at them as like, oh, what are you doing? Don't. The, the officers turn around, they see these guys standing in line to get pay and they basically just freak out until they come back with a whole bunch of money in their hands. It's like, yeah, we went and got paid. And <laughs> cheeky little bastards. But, um... The officers go into the officer mess and they have dinner with the officers and they sort of officer gossip. Um, the Bruckner and Essner are not with them because, again, they're trainers. Keep that in yet. These guys are trainers. They don't do missions. Anyway, Bruckner and Essner are not with them. Uh, not the whole unit doesn't go at once because that would just be weird. But like 20 or 30 guys go out of the 38. So there's a giant part of the army just infiltrated German camp for the night. They just leave, <laughs> and so that's sort of their first... That's seen as, like, the first mission of this unit is... Uh, uh, can we exist? Is this a viable thing to do? To, to infiltrate the German army like this, and they find out? Absolutely it is. So, I'll end this video by setting up the next one. A man walks into the camp on the, on the banks of the Suez. A man by the name of David Sterling. You might know him as the head of the SAS, the guy who literally created the SAS. David Sterling has a problem. You see, his SAS are damn good at navigating in the desert. They were taught by the best. They were taught by the LRDG, who were taught by three, uh, by two of the four best navigators in the world at navigating in the desert. The other is a Hungarian uh, aristocrat living in Hungary under strict, like the most strict uh, SOE, MI5, MI6 military intelligence surveillance impossible. The other is about to be killed in an aircraft explosion when one of the bombs he's carrying blows up, but he's in the Middle East flying aircraft. So the, the, half of the best, uh, that's important later. Remember, everything I'm telling you is important. Don't disregard any of it. Uh, so the, the, the two best desert explorers in the world trained the LRDG, who trained the SAS. David Sterling knows how to get around the desert. He doesn't know how to be a German, though. And in order to do what he needs done, he needs to infiltrate the German army. Well, what does he need done? You're going to have to find out next time as we, you, you join me for the next episode on the SIG. Um, I might call the series something. I'm not sure yet. Anyway. I'm going to put these videos out, one on Monday, one on thir on Friday, so you guys can get a double dash. That's Monday, Friday, my time, that problem. So look out for those things on a Friday and a Monday. I hope you enjoyed the series. If you do, make sure you comment below, hit the like button. It really helps out the channel. Thank you very much for watching, and have a wonderful day.